good evening doctors this is harish murthy from micro labs i welcome all of you heartily to this first of our webinar series called as beating hearts the topic for today as you know is role of bisoprolol in young hypertensives uh, dr muruganathan is in conversation with dr sarath chandra who will be the speaker dr muruganathan all of you know uh, is a is a well known uh, figure in the field of medicine and cardiology he has been a past emeritus professor from the tamil nadu mgr university he is the international advisor for royal college of physicians glasgow international member of the medical education board of rcp glasgow advisory council member of national board of examination he is also the director of hold medical academy and chief editor of medi beats and he dr muruganathan has been the immediate past governor of the american college of physicians india chapter and dr muruganathan has been the dean indian college of physicians from 2016 to 17 he's been the president of the hypertension society of india from 2015 to 16 and the president of association of physicians of india from 2013 to 14 it's a honor sir to have you here and i would uh, on behalf of michael apps welcome both dr muruganathan and dr sharath chandra and i now hand over the session to dr muruganathan thank you very much uh, good evening my dear brothers and sisters following the world hypertension day which is uh, which happened on 17th of may now a lot of uh, activities are going on on hypertension one of the important aspects of hypertension especially in india we get lot of young hypertensives now i think uh, uh, if you see more than 14% of the people who are having hypertension are less than 40 years so it's really, really alarming especially when these people are in the software industry they don't have system they don't have any lifestyle uh, modification they all get lot of problems especially hypertension and uh, again different different people define in in different way uh, some people say less than 55 or more than 65 is old less than 55 is in but whatever it is even less than 40 years the statistic says 14% of the people are having hypertension it's quite alarming okay now today our learned speaker a great academician a great professor a great communicator a great cardiologist now he is going to talk to us on the young hypertensives and the role of bisoprolol a beta blocker what is the role many international guidelines they don't give importance to beta blocker as a first line drug whereas in india we give much importance to beta blocker especially in younger people who are anxious and especially women who are going to be pregnant this beta blocker is very useful i think sarath chandra also was the uh, one of the authors for the india heart study where they found in india the average heart rate is 83 so definitely we have to use beta blocker and that too in an india in the young hypertensive beta blockers are very very useful and um, uh, today's talk our professor sarachandra a consultant cardiologist uh, he did the uh, md in pgi chandigarh dm also in pgi chandigarh he is a junior cardiologist railway hospital perambur and then he was assistant cardiologist durga bai dismok hospital hyderabad now consultant cardiologist apollo hospital hyderabad medvin hospital hyderabad faculty at nims consultant cardiologist indo us super specialty hospital and vrinchi hospital hyderabad from 2012 till date he has done lot of work on various aspects of cardiology he was the editor uh, he was academically very active and uh, a good communicator so his uh, work on hypertension is exemplary so he is the right person to talk about in hypertension and the role of bisoprolol of course uh, now the newer beta blockers 
the beta blockers have started uh, coming to the market in 1960 onwards. And uh, now the third generation of the recent uh, beta blockers, are, which are good, like misoprolol, metoprolol, nebivolol, uh, we use left and right for all patients, in, even though they may not have any cardiac problem also. And our uh, beloved speaker, Dr. Sarachandra, is going to highlight what is the role of bisoprolol in any hypertensive? My dear brothers and sisters, please post your question in the chat box. And then uh, Dr. Sarachandra and myself will try to answer and clear your doubts. Because this is a very important topic, especially in hypertensive. We love to focus and concentrate uh, this time. Uh, because the awareness among the hypertensive is less. Slow detection, slow uh, treatment not taking treatment are the main reasons why the young hypertensives are not controlled. They don't, they, uh, they don't submit themselves for a BP checkup. That is why we always say opportunity screening. Even if they bring their parents for checkup, we'll check the attender who is young also for uh, blood pressure. There we can, by, thereby we can diagnose early, early detection and con uh, continuing treatment is the key and then creating awareness and education to the young people are very much important. So with these few words of introduction, I have great pleasure in welcoming my friend, Dr. Sarachandra, to deliver his lecture on role of bisoprolol in young hypertensive. Over to you, my friend, Sarachandra. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So, uh, you know, when Dr. Murugnathan is sitting there and says somebody else is having exemplary work on hypertension, that is an exaggeration. Uh, Dr. Murugunathan, as you all know, he has done everything in relation to hypertension. I mean, vast number of publications and lectures and so on. We all have learned so much from him. Just to add to my CV, I was the editor of Indian Heart Journal in uh, 2012 to 14. And uh, I was president of Cardiological Society of India in 2018. All right, let me have the slides, please. Okay, can you maximize the size? Can you make the slide bigger? Uh, sir, you can screen in the screen uh, increase the size by clicking right bottom. There is a one square. Just click on that. At the bottom of the uh, uh, that screen, that uh, corner of the slide, sir. There is a one square. Just once you click on that, it will oh, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, and now to go forwards, backwards, uh, okay, I can see it here. All right, so, you know, uh, as Dr. Murugnathan just now said, we just had the, um, you know, uh, hypertension day of the world uh, just on the 17th of this month. And, uh, uh, you know, I will uh, just describe to you the uh, details of one particular patient I saw on that very day. He was, uh, He's 47. Uh, he came to me having been referred by an ophthalmologist. And he went to the ophthalmologist because he had a reduced vision in his right eye. And the doctor has diligently examined the patient and wrote that there are signs of hypertensive retinopathy with the macular edema, which is probably responsible for his reduction of uh, vision. And she said, you go and get your blood pressure checked. That's how circuitously he came to check his blood pressure. He never checked his blood pressure at the age of 47. And uh, such is the poor knowledge, even today. Even today, when we talk so much about preventive cardiology, prevention of hypertension, diabetes, and so on, we still see patients like him. And then his blood pressure was 220 by 150. And then she wrote that this is malignant hypertension, go to a cardiologist. He came to me, the blood pressure was still very high. And uh, his evaluation showed that he already had elevated serum creatinine. His uh, calculated uh, EGFR is around 60. And uh, the patient uh, um, uh, otherwise had no cardiac symptoms, no symptoms whatsoever. But he already suffered damage in his eyes as well as in his kidneys. His um, left ventricular hypertrophy is also present on echocardiogram. Electrocardiogram was surprisingly normal. Well, not very surprisingly because we know that left ventricular hypertrophy uh, is the gold standard is echocardiography. The electrocardiogram may or may not have changes, but we know that if left ventricular hypertrophy is 
also evident an ecg his prognosis is far worse so on one area he is relatively saved in one area but he already has uh, such um, disastrous uh, um, you know disease so anyway so now we talk of uh, role of bisoprolol in young hypertensives as already mentioned the exact definition of this is not clear it could be 40 it could be even young adults uh, many of the uh, lot of data which will be presented to you today pertains to those patients who are less than 40 all right um, the next slide okay hypertension is the leading risk factor for comorbidities and death globally the world health organization has estimated that more than 1.5 billion will have hypertension by 2025. This was the prediction in uh, 2012. Probably it will be exceeding that figure. And you can see among all the comorbidities, people are predicted to have, 58% are predicted to have high blood pressure, uh, cholesterol, which is elevated in 45%, ischemic heart is in 31%, arthritis 29%, diabetes in 28%, all figures which are very, very scary. Heart failure is mentioned as 16%. Imagine the numbers. Okay, <clears throat> this is a slide that shows that one in five young adults in India has uh, high blood pressure. This is uh, published by Ramakrishnan, who is a very uh, popular doctor from Malinda Institute. Uh, incidentally, he's from Tamil Nadu, but he is in Malinda Institute for a very long time. This is a very good study published in Indian Art Journal, incidentally, in 2019. Uh, the prevalence among women in that particular study was 23.7% compared to the much higher prevalence among male participants, which was 34.2%. Now, these are the figures in the overall group, as you see on the right-hand side of the bar, bar diagrams. But if you go to younger age groups, you can see the difference. When you look at the 18 to 19 age group, the difference between females and males is far greater. The difference be becomes correspondingly less so, and at the age of 65 to 75, there is hardly any difference between the sexes. So uh, the number of people who have uh, uh, anger, the young adults who have hypertension, it comes to 80 million people, more than the entire population of the United Kingdom. That is, of course, the strength of our country. All right. So uh, uh, it just shows that in this particular study, men are more commonly found to have hypertension at younger age. But as time passes, the two sexes become equal in their numbers. Risk factors for hypertension in young adults. It is, of course, sedentary lifestyle. As mentioned earlier, uh, the software company people, you see so many of them coming with uh, hypertension because of their poor lifestyle. They're awake in the night when everybody is sleeping and they sleep in the daytime, completely altered uh, uh, you know, cycle and diurnal cycle. And of course, because of their long sitting, they tend to develop uh, overweight and hypertension and diabetes, which we see routinely in Hyderabad, which has a huge population of uh, software industry workers. I'm sure it is the same in Chennai or uh, Pune or any place where the software industry has uh, mushroom. And of course, uh, diabetes is a risk factor. As you all know, 80% of diabetics will eventually develop hypertension. And hypertensives, nearly 80%. If you check their glucose parameters, uh, they 80% of them will have uh, one abnormality of the, of the other of glucose metabolism. Obesity is an important risk factor, as we know. High salt diet, frequent consumption of junk food, use of illicit drugs, psychiatric condition of the youth. A very important point that is missed out in this slide is frequent consumption of alcohol, which we all know that uh, excess alcohol consumption is a very important risk factor for you know, hyper development of hypertension. I always recollect one of my friends who was my classmate uh, in intermediate. I met him after many, many years. Uh, we, of course, went to different professions and I met him after many, many years. And by the time he already developed a stroke, he was on four drugs for hypertension. And somehow during the, my interrogation of this fellow, uh, his wife told me and uh, he also accepted that he drinks too much. And all I said is that you give up your alcohol, you will become a narmotensive or at least it may come down so much that you may not require many drugs. Believe me, he really got impressed. He stopped alcohol, and now he just takes one drug for hypertension. He's a slightly obese person. Uh, he has no family history of hypertension. 
and uh, now it is uh, something like 20 years since he had that stroke and he had absolutely no problem whatsoever after that particular uh, uh, consultation so alcohol plays a very big role in uh, the development of hypertension and perpetuation and uh, actually making it difficult to treat these patients systemic overdrive sympathetic overdrive in development of hypertension is marked wrongly sympathetic overdrive in development of hypertension activation of sympathetic nervous system is a critical aspect of uh, human hypertension studies have shown that muscle sympathetic nerve activity is increased in many types of hypertension in humans sympathetic activity is controlled by several cascades from peripheral inputs to central nervous system we will elaborate on this uh, in the slides down it determines the central sympathetic outflow in the brain stem and hypothalamus so sympathetic nervous system in addition to renin angiotensin system plays a very important role in the development and sustenance of hypertension the renin angiotensin system is indirectly affected by um, sympathetic outflow from the brain brain and uh, due to activation of renin angiotensin system further worsening of uh, hypertension occurs so sympathetic outflow by its direct actions as well as by acting through the renin angiotensin system worsens the hypertension heart rate and subsequent blood pressure in young adults this is a particular study um, called the cardia study and as evidenced in the coronary artery risk development in young adults sympathetic overdrive is often accompanied by low parasympathetic tone which further exacerbates the development of hypertension parasympathetic tone if it is high blood pressure actually comes down that's how these devices have come where people have implanted uh, a low frequency stimulation of carotid baroreceptors and actually uh, these are one of the things that are tried as treatment of resistant hypertension uh, in fact uh, india also a good number of patients have undergone uh, this particular therapy and of course it's not something that is uh, accepted by fda at this point of time but uh, it shows the importance of uh, the parasympathetic tone so high sympathetic tone and low parasympathetic tone they together Uh, go on to uh, lead to hypertension so this is a slide that shows several things the brain's uh, sympathetic overdrive in development of hypertension leading to uh, left ventricular hypertrophy increased incidence of arrhythmias uh, increased oxygen consumption heart rate increase systolic heart failure heart failure preserved ejection fraction if systolic failure has not occurred the diastolic dysfunction with resultant Uh, hfpf and in addition uh, the brain sympathetic output can lead to increased renin and the ras activation increased sodium retention and decreased renal blood flow and this can be um, you know interpreted by the kidneys as reduced plasma volume and renal efferent nerves go on to the brain and then they produce further worsening of this leading to a vicious cycle there can also be directly vasoconstriction and increased insulin resistance together all of them uh, lead to uh, development and sustenance of hypertension activation of the ras system has an adverse effect on the heart of hypertensive individuals it increases the heart rate and eventually progresses to it is not correct to say eventually can can lead to development of arrhythmias particularly atrial fibrillation sympathetic over sorry go back okay. this is a good slide that shows a correlation between heart rate and risk of death uh, and when you see here on the right side the heart rate uh, in these individuals in this particular study is shown to be between 60 to 80 and here you can see all their parameters are low whether it is uh, coronary heart disease related mortality or uh, overall cvd related mortality or all cause mortality when you go to the rate between 80 to 100 these figures go up and when you go to the resting heart rate of more than 100 these figures go up much more so it indicates that your resting heart rate actually is a very important determinant of uh, long term mortality everyone knows it whether this means that you should give drugs that will reduce the resting heart rate is debatable but we know that 
this is one way of understanding that sympathetic drive is an important uh, it, it plays an important role in the causation of uh, mortality and morbidity over years one of the most striking effects of hypertension on the heart is left ventricular hypertrophy we all know about it i mentioned earlier also that uh, you know um, left ventricular hypertrophy is gold standard is echocardiography but it can also be detected on electrocardiogram and let me emphasize once again that if you see ecg changes of left ventricular hypertrophy that patient's prognosis is far worse compared to a patient who has left ventricular hypertrophy but the electrocardiogram does not show any changes it has been suggested that around 36 to 41% of all hypertensives have left ventricular hypertrophy many patients who have white coat hypertension one of the ways to detect it is the absence of end organ damage one of the important things is uh, left ventricular hypertrophy it is not necessarily present in all patients of hypertension but if it is present then and in the absence of any other cause for uh, left ventricular hypertrophy you have to understand that is probably having hypertension and that hypertension is already leading to the left ventricular hypertrophy you can see here that uh, cardio this uh, diagram on this uh, left side that hemodynamic stress leads to hypertension they are all uh, you know kind of vicious circuit renin angiotensin aldosterone system and then that can lead to oxidative stress inflammation atherosclerosis endothelial dysfunction once again oxidative stress so many of these pathophysiologic factors contribute to the morbidity and mortality of hypertensive patients okay so blood pressure and cardiovascular health patients with left ventricular hypertrophy a two times high two times to four times higher rate of cardiovascular events such as arrhythmias af related strokes etc independent of other risk factors so you have hypertrophy and you have hypertension and left ventricular hypertrophy it straight away indicates that the prognosis in the long term is worse than a person who has hypertension but no left ventricular hypertrophy you can see here the cardiac effects are left ventricular wall thickness increase left ventricular mass and uh, together you call it uh, left ventricular hypertrophy hemodynamic changes may be higher mean pulse pressure higher stroke volume index higher total peripheral resistance index increased stroke volume and aortic stiffness contributed contribute to isolated systolic hypertension in young adults this is uh, published uh, in uh, way back in 2005 in hypertension so it is um, in young adults one of the important contributing factors towards uh, towards hypertension is the increased stroke volume these patients have increased sympathetic drive the rate may be increased and the stroke volume is increased and together the cardiac output is increased and that may be an important contributing factor for the development of hypertension okay this is a, a interesting diagram that shows on the bottom quartiles of pulse wave velocity as it increases and on the left side quartiles of stroke volume so when stroke volume is maximal and pulse wave velocity is maximal the pulse pressure is highest so isolated systolic hypertension in young adults involves elevation of stroke volume or aortic stiffness or both importance of treating hypertension in young adults well it is important to treat hypertension in everyone uh, we agree today that octogenarians also will benefit by treating hypertension but when it comes to young adults obviously the importance is far greater because he is supposed to live much longer correspondingly longer and therefore the chances of developing adverse effects of long standing hypertension are greater in these patients in this group of patients and therefore the greater importance of diagnosing and treating these patients hypertension in young adults can lead to serious health problem such as heart disease stroke and kidney disease young adults with hypertension are at increased risk for developing other health conditions such as obesity high cholesterol and diabetes the first line says what are the effects of hypertension the second line says the usual associations with hypertension and they are they are kind of a, a vicious cycle once again obesity and it is common to find these comorbidities like diabetes high cholesterol and obesity in these patients hypertension is often a silent condition that can cause significant damage to organs as i as exemplified in the by the first patient which i mentioned it is a very classical example of hypertension being a silent killer 
And in that particular patient, as I mentioned, he already has CKD, he already has retinopathy. And it's only a matter of time. If he does not control his hypertension, his condition can get, get worse. So hypertension is often a silent condition, particularly in younger people who really don't go for so, so often for checkups and uh, therefore suffer more. Pharmacological factors in relation to beta blockers. We have to accept that beta blockers by and large are not considered first line drugs for hypertension. We don't have evidence for that and even guidelines do not mention that uh, beta blockers are first line drugs. But there are many situations in which due to one or other comorbidity are exemplified by this particular group about which you, whom you are talking, the young hypertensives, beta blockers remain or become an important uh, indication for this. Particularly, for example, if you have ischemic heart disease, you have angina, you have post-myocardial infarction patients, you have patients who have heart failure, all these groups, beta blockers automatically become important drugs for the control of hypertension. So that, let us say a patient of heart failure uh, with or without hypertension is a candidate for beta blocker. But if he has hypertension also, you are even more happy actually to give beta blocker because that helps this patient to a greater extent. And young hypertensives because of so many factors as I mentioned, who have increased sympathetic drive, probably this is another group where beta blocker should be considered strongly. Beta blockers in treating hypertension. Beta blockers block the effects of uh, catecholamines on the heart and blood vessels, thereby reducing the heart rate and force of contraction of the heart. As mentioned earlier, many of these patients, one of the important pathogenic factors is increased cardiac output. And there is already a resting heart rate increase and increased force of contraction. And beta blockers come in very well to reduce the heart rate and the force of contraction. And to an extent, uh, a reduction of the cardiac output also, and thereby contributing to a reduction of the blood pressure. Effective in reducing hypertension in monotherapy or in combination therapy, beta blockers reduce the risk of cardiovascular events by suppressing the release of renin and inhibiting the effects on CNS. Bisoprolol, when you talk specifically, uh, it affects, it is a cardioselective beta blocker. It is one of the good agents to be called uh, cardioselective beta blockers. Uh, in uh, heart failure especially, out of the three drugs which are accepted for treatment of heart failure with beta blockers, apart from carvedilol and metoprolol, uh, succinate, uh, bisoprolol is another agent. The CBS group of trials which were published way back when, around the time when, uh, you know, we just became cardiologists, um, bisoprolol was, uh, um, you know, um, it, it was shown and proved clearly to be superior to placebo in terms of uh, morbidity and mortality uh, in relation to heart failure. Somehow in India, bisoprolol is, uh, to my knowledge, not so commonly used. More often, doctors tend to use metoprolol, and uh, in heart failure patients, carvedilol is particularly popular because of some of the important studies like uh, U.S. carvedilol study and so on. But uh, bisoprolol has equally good, equally good and equally encouraging outcome results in relation to uh, heart failure, in relation to cardiovascular events in post myocardial infarction patients, and so on. And here we will look at the data in relation to hypertension. Bisoprolol blocks the beta-1 receptors, which lead to a reduction in CAMP and reduce the rate and force of contraction and reduce cardiac output, as I mentioned. Efficacy and tolerability of beta-1 selective beta blocker bisoprolol as a first-line antihypertensive in Indian patients diagnosed with essential hypertension, an open-label multicentric observational study. There are so many names of which I immediately recollect the name of Dr. Swam Sundram, my good friend. And uh, this is published uh, way back in uh, 2012. Target BP was achieved in 96.5%. 44% of patients. These are smaller studies, and uh, you cannot really say that, uh, uh, you know, you can quote it everywhere, but if you, in this particular study, the target BP was achieved in 96% of the patients. Bisoprolol can be used as one of the first-line antihypertensives in Indian patients. That is the uh, inference from this particular study. This was uh, published in BMJ Open in 2012. 
efficacy and safety of bisoprolol compared to other selective beta blockers in the treatment of hypertension a systematic review and meta analysis of randomized parallel clinical trials this has shown bisoprolol showed a significant reduction in heart rate baroreflex sensitivity and improved uh, hdl cholesterol levels compared to other uh, beta blockers selective beta blockers this is a little controversial the data that is shown in this beta blockers usually increase the triglycerides and bring down the hdl but of course these are transient effects they don't last beyond 3 months but the well known side effect on lipid profile is an increase in the triglycerides and a slight fall in uh, hdl in these patients okay effects of bisoprolol on heart rate variability in heart failure we know that in heart failure patients heart rate variability takes a back seat there is a reduction in heart rate variability which is not good we want heart rate variability in our patients in heart failure patients this is reduced by giving bisoprolol you can actually improve the heart rate variability which indirectly should lead to an improvement in this outcome of these patients another important thing is the effect on erectile dysfunction we know that uh, the best drug for erectile dysfunction among beta blockers is uh, nebivolol because of its vasodilatory effect however in this particular trial you can see here men with high blood pressure have two times higher risk of uh, uh, loss of libido and erectile dysfunction there is an impaired penile blood flow and erectile dysfunction these are common things to see uh, in patients who have hypertension and more so often uh, in patients who have a combination of hypertension and diabetes which is a very common situation which we face day in and out in our clinics so the antihypertensives and sexual dysfunction deterioration in sexual function a reduced quality of life and non compliance with therapy many patients who are taking beta blockers they do come and say that there's a loss of uh, the, the erectile dysfunction has become so common in our society due to early occurrence of diabetes and hypertension and it's not uncommon at all for uh, patients to complain about this particular adverse effect of the drugs of the disease itself and if the drugs add to it then it can be worse antihypertensive and sexual dysfunction bisoprolol in this particular data has been shown to have very minimal effect on male sexual function carbidilol in this trial has been shown to have 13.5% increase of uh, uh, ed propranolol 5.0 times etinolol 3.0 times and bisoprolol hardly any effect this may be contested Uh, generally it is mentioned that uh, nebivolol is the best drug if you have an indication strong indication for uh, uh, a beta blocker in a patient who is likely to have erectile dysfunction probably you should consider nebivolol but the data from this particular trial shows that bisoprolol also is a good agent to consider in these patients importance of adherence to hypertensive treatment is 29% reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events 33% reduction in cv mortality 37% reduction in heart failure uh, this is a old and well known thing compared to those days in 1940s and 50s when people said hypertension is to be called essential hypertension because they said that you should not bring down hypertension from that day a lot of water has flown under the bridge and we now accept that hypertension is an important contributor to adverse outcomes and if you control hypertension you will give them a improved life cardiovascular events reduction mortality reduction chances of heart failure reduction all are improved and this is true even for older group of patients also non pharmacological factors lifestyle modifications for these patients is Uh, you know some of them are mentioned because the young adults are likely to have some of these things smoking is more common in the young adults taking alcohol and uh, um, not following a healthy uh, eating pattern so all of them you need to connect educate your patient on the importance of quitting smoking which will straight away reduce his blood pressure by 2 to 4 mm of systolic pressure nearly similar effect by reducing the alcohol consumption follow a healthy eating pattern about which we will talk again maintaining a healthy weight and becoming physically active these are all 
important and i hope all of you who treat hypertensive patients don't merely prescribe drugs but also educate the patient spend some time about good lifestyle the patient may or may not follow it totally but at least it will have some impact on his lifestyle Okay, we can skip this slide, which is not of much relevance for this talk. Now, look at this. This is a very important slide that shows the effect of various lifestyle changes that will lead to a certain degree of uh, reduction of blood pressure. The first one is the weight loss. Maintain a normal body weight of body mass index between 18.5 to 24.9. And if you can bring down a 10 kg weight loss, it's not easy. Probably 10 kg weight loss is something uh, you will see uh, in patients who are, uh, subject themselves to bariatric surgery. I keep telling my patients that if they are really obese, they should consider bariatric surgery. It will not only reduce their chances of hypertension in future, it also reduces their chances of diabetes. And in fact, you will see many patients of diabetes who are taking large doses of insulin. The moment they undergo bariatric surgery of any form, the requirement for the insulin comes down like 100% almost. They require very small doses. It is important they maintain that weight, but um, today bariatric surgery is something that has come in a big way in relation to weight loss. And if the patient can achieve a 10 kg weight loss, there can be a five to 20 millimeters fall of systolic blood pressure. Imagine five to 20 millimeters fall is a very big fall. If the patient follows DASH type of dietary, which means consume a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, low fat dairy products with a reduced content of saturated and total fat. Once again, eight to 14 millimeters of uh, blood pressure loss can be there, blood pressure fall can be there. Reduced salt intake, reduce the dietary sodium intake as much as possible. Ideally, to 65 millimoles a day, which is equivalent to roughly 1.5 grams of sodium or 3.8 grams per day of sodium chloride. We know there are certain primitive communities in this world uh, who do not know what is salt. And they, they, they have a very, very low incidence of uh, hypertension. And uh, if, the, if our patients, Indian patients, salt intake, as you know, is significantly higher compared to many other countries. And if they can throw away uh, at least partly the salt in their diet, it can once again lead to two to eight millimeters fall of blood pressure. Physical activity, there is no need to emphasize the importance of uh, regular physical activity, at least 30 minutes a day on most days of the week. Some of the societies say at least 150 minutes a week. And if they really do that, uh, it not only brings down the blood pressure, it brings down the uh, glucose intolerance, uh, cut down the weight, or at least prevent further weight increase. And the benefits of regular physical activity, I can tell you, are endless. Moderation of alcohol intake, I would say as doctors, if you say it is okay, to take some bit of uh, alcohol, the patient usually extends it and actually bulldozes his wife and says that, no, no, it is okay. Doctor said some drink you can have, but he never stops with that. As a physician, I would tell my patients alcohol is absolutely bad for his health. There is some data that alcohol can increase the HDL that we all know, but how much, to what extent it will improve the patient's long-term outcome is really questionable. There are so many other aspects of, aspects of uh, excessive alcohol intake like the effect on the liver, effect on the blood pressure, which are ignored by most of us. We only talk of that small questionable uh, evidence in favor of patient's health, that is an increase in the HDL, but forget about uh, other things. And uh, it is important as physicians, we should not encourage the intake of alcohol by uh, any of our patients. If you, as I mentioned earlier, if patient can bring down his alcohol intake, there's a two to four millimeter fall Another thing that should be mentioned is stopping smoking also will bring down the systolic blood pressure levels. So what is DASH diet? diet dietary approaches to stop hypertension. I'm sure every, every one of you have heard this word, uh, DASH diet, low in saturated and trans fats. Trans fats, the importance of which you all know, are rich in potassium, calcium, and magnesium and fiber low in sodium and rich in protein. That is what is a DASH diet. Not easy to practice, but we should know about it. Now, this is a typical um, you know, DASH diet where the vegetables and fruits form uh, you know, the bottom of the pyramid of DASH diet. And 
towards the top, you know, and it's a, it's a pyramid indicating at the top are sweets and uh, oils, and at the bottom are vegetables and fruits, meaning that it not, not in importance, the bottom is actually the wide uh, part of the pyramid, and it shows the importance of eating lots of vegetables and fruits. It is not easy for every person in our society to follow this, but we should emphasize the importance of this. So, uh, you know, this algorithm for treatment of hypertension, uh, you can see here in stage one hypertension, uh, thiazide diuretics form the first choice in many times. And you may consider ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, et cetera, are a combination of it. In stage two hypertension, you already require straight away two drugs. One is to confirm that patient has stage two hypertension. It is not a white coat hypertension. It is not one of those things, uh, which is one time reading of hypertension. You confirm the patient's hypertension by doing adequately home BB, BB monitoring, multiple readings, and uh, if required, ambulatory BP monitoring. And after all that, you have confirmed that he has hypertension. You can straight away go for two drugs. And in this algorithm, one can actually add young hypertensives who exhibit signs of increased sympathetic overflow, and uh, particularly as evidenced by increased resting heart rate and other signs of sympathetic overflow. Probably in that group of patients, bisoprolol uh, as a beta blocker is a very, very good agent. So of course, if one of the other drugs has not given uh, adequate follow blood pressure, beta blockers may always be considered to be add on to the other drugs like ACE inhibitors and uh, um, ARPs. All right. So summary is hypertension is a leading cause of death globally. Not only death, morbidities, which includes heart failure. Sympathetic overdrive accompanied by parasympathetic, reduced parasympathetic tone, accelerates the development of hypertension. Bisoprolol can be used as the first line antihypertensive in Indian patients. Bisoprolol does not affect sexual function in young hypertensives. Rather, it affects minimally. Lifestyle and dietary modifications are important to manage hypertension over and above the drugs. Rather, probably drugs are over and above the lifestyle and dietary modifications. Conclusion, in young hypertensives, bisoprolol in combination with lifestyle modifications can improve life, hypertension control and reduce the risk of uh, associated complications. Thank you very much. A wonderful uh, talk, very crisp and very clear. Uh, so now uh, we'll go to the chat box. Uh, I'll ask questions later on. Nikki Ranjan, which way it is better than metaprolol? Bisoprolol, in which way is better than metaprolol? Uh, can I see these questions, sir? Uh, where do we see these questions? Uh, um, they they have given in the side the chat box. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm not able to see it. Uh, can somebody tell me? Anyway, let me take this question. It is not easy to say that, uh, you know, this drug scores over metoprolol. If you, if I, as a cardiologist speak, the heart failure trials, the benefit of bis, uh, bisoprolol in CBS trial is almost as good or equal to that of metoprolol as seen in other uh, big trials of uh, heart failure trials. So, uh, and you don't have a very uh, clear head-to-head uh, -head comparison in relation to metoprolol and uh, bisoprolol. So it is not easy to say that one drug scores over the other. And uh, one thing that is claimed is that bisoprolol may have lesser incidence of uh, erectile dysfunction. So uh, this is what I would say. For hypertension, hypertension alone, most of these beta blockers, they come as uh, slightly lower down compared to uh, ARBs and ACE inhibitors and so on, as per the guidelines. Or young hypertensives who exhibit uh, evidence of uh, a sympathetic uh, drive is increased, then these drugs are useful. Yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. Sarachandra. Uh, the metaprolol succinate has got the same equation like bisoprolol, whereas metaprolol uh, tartrate has got uh, a lesser effect yeah. than the bisoprolol. So if you ask me which is better, uh, bisoprolol is better than metaprolol tartrate. I cannot, I cannot say the same thing as metaprolol succinate and the bisoprolol. 
and uh, Sarachandra has given a very interesting point. If somebody, young fellow, who has got erectile dysfunction, if you have to use uh, cardiovascular drug, I mean, sorry, beta blocker, bisoprolol is better than metoprolol. So that way, uh, I think it is better. Now, the second question, Gubinder Singh, what are activities lead to sympathetic overdrive? Well, um, you know, uh, any activity which you do, whether you are, uh, you know, uh, watching a movie or, uh, you know, a movie where there's a lot of uh, action and anxiety and suspense, or you are doing physical activity, any of them, anything that stimulates your sympathetic system will produce increased uh, sympathetic drive. It also indicates, it's also in relation to uh, even sexual activity also. So uh, m most of your activities which produce, okay. um, you know, uh, increased activity, okay. whether physical or mental activity, will lead to a rise in the sympathetic activity. I just want to add one point. Most of uh, the, regarding the earlier question, um, what Dr. Murugunathan said is very important. Most of the data in relation to metoprolol is in relation to metoprolol succinate. We almost don't use metoprolol tartrate after the earlier studies have come. Most of the data is in relation to metoprolol succinate, the long-acting metoprolol. Yeah, and also <clears throat> we, there are some studies where if the patient has got COPD or asthma, the bisoprolol, nebivalol is better than metoprolol. I mean, there are some studies. Of course, individual yeah. variation in the condition, the time, everything. So all the uh, beta blockers have got its own uh, benefits or uh, side effects. For example, if it is migraine, uh, propanolol is better. If there is atrial fibrillation or arrhythmia, uh, propanolol is better because membrane stabilizing drug. So each beta blocker has got its own uh, plus and minus. And the affinity of uh, beta 1 selective was nebulol. Nebulol is 321, 1 is to 321 compared to uh, uh, bisoprolol and metoprolol. So different dep depends on the condition, depends on the age, depends on the comorbidity. So each one, every, you know, we cannot say uh, the same shoe fits everyone. One size fits all is not correct. Now coming to the next question. I just want to and... say something. Can I say one point, sir? Yeah, yeah, please. The, sir. Yeah, the so-called, uh, um, you know, beta 1 selectivity is a very good point in relation to average doses. When the doses go very high, the selectivity is relatively lost. And any of these so-called uh, beta-1 selective beta blockers, like, you know, metoprolol or uh, bisoprolol or any, uh, you know, these drugs, they lose their efficacy in relation to asthma worsening uh, when the doses are higher. So that has to be kept in mind. So it's good to say generally that you can use beta blockers in the presence of uh, mild asthma if there is a compelling indication. For example, you have a patient of COAD, but he has heart failure due to left ventricular dysfunction, not right ventricular dysfunction, uh, car pulmonary, which occurs in patients of COAD. If he has clear-cut heart failure due to left ventricular dysfunction and COAD, or for that matter, a patient who has got clear-cut indication, like in terms of uh, you know recent myocardial infarction, in these patients, there is a compelling indication for beta blocker, even in the presence of COAD. But you have to remember this, that you start with a small dose and go up. And therefore, uh, in, in case of an occasional patient uh, whose COPD worsens, you may have to backtrack and remove the beta blocker. That's the one point I want to say. Yeah. Now, the Vijay Raghavan, in renal artery stenosis, patients this beta blocker decrease the renal blood flow or increase creatinine. Well, we don't have really that kind of evidence. The one drug that actually worsens the renal function and uh, renal blood flow are the ACE inhibitors or ARBs. In fact, uh, people say that if you give the if you give a patient of hypertension ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and suddenly you see a drastic follow pressure or a rise in the serum creatinine, uh, you should suspect renal artery stenosis. With beta blockers, usually these things are not seen. Yes. Now, Rukesh Gosai, how you justify role of beta blockers as primary antihypertensive when there is no compelling indication? Well, if there is no compelling indication, then you know it, they are uh, not the first line drug. Why should I justify it? Compelling indications, as I mentioned, are congestive heart failure, 
uh, recent myocardial infarction, LV dysfunction due to any reason. Even if it is not recent myocardial infarction, if there is LV dysfunction that is persisting over years, these are all compelling indications for beta blockers. There you can justify. If there is no compelling indication, you cannot uh, justify the role of beta blockers as antihypertensive agents. Of course, with a certain bracket for these young adults who have high sympathetic flow and they have a resting heart rate increase and uh, they have issues uh, like you know um, excessive work and you are concerned that they have uh, increased sympathetic outflow, you can consider beta blockers in these patients. Very important thing also, is that to see is, yeah, please go ahead, sir. No, also in a young uh, woman, young women reproductive age when they are over sympathetic overdrive, and uh, obviously we cannot put A's and ARB because they are in the reproductive age. So that time also sometimes young ladies we give beta blockers. That's all. But Manjunath is asking if we can give 2.5 milligram bisoprolol replacing metoprolol. Can we do that? Uh, uh, 2.5 milligram bisoprolol along with metoprolol. No, replacing metoprolol. Suppose metoprolol you are giving. Can we replace yeah. with 2.5 milligram? No, first of all, why should you replace a particular drug? Unless there is a re reason. If you have a metoprolol, uh, 25 milligrams, and patient is uh, uh, you know happy with that, for whatever reason you are given metoprolol, there is no reason to shift him to, whether it is 2.5 or 5 is a, an unimportant point, is a good point. Uh, why should you shift the patient from one beta blocker to another beta blocker. Unless you tell me what is the particular reason. Patient is not tolerating a particular beta blocker. That's a different no, this matter. Actually, this scenario comes, Sarachandra, in a government hospital or in a private hospital okay. where they don't get metoprolol sample and suddenly they get bisoprolol. They always equate, you know, okay. whether this 2.5 is equal. You know, in government hospital, if there is no metoprolol, if they have a bisoprolol supply, this question comes. Okay. Abhay Singh Deora, my good friend uh, from... Rajasthan is asking, ideal beta blocker for patients with diabetes mellitus, is it nebivalol or bisoprolol? Um, bisoprolol, there is no evidence that uh, diabetes control is worsened, particularly in relation to bisoprolol. Now, let me say a couple of points here. Any beta blocker can mask hypoglycemia that can occur in a patient. So, you know, and as a cardiologist, uh, you, I will say 80% of my patients are diabetics. I, I, I am an interventional cardiologist and almost most patients who come to us have diabetes. In that patient, because he has undergone, he has had a acute coronary syndrome, he had a proper STEMI, there is a compelling indication for beta block. Therefore, we really don't think twice about it. But in relation to your question, uh, you know, uh, what exactly is the point, sir? His point is? No, uh, his point is, uh, in diabetes mellitus, do you use uh, okay. maybe we'll all. Yeah. yeah. So since diabetic patients have, with cardiac disease, there is a compelling indication. If that is not there in diabetic patients, my first choice for hypertension, suppose you have a diabetic patient who has uh, no coronary artery disease documented, his LV echocardiogram is normal, uh, there is no compelling indication for using a beta block. My choice in that drug is an ARB or an AC inhibitor. And, uh, you know, nowadays for resistant hypertension, a lot of people are using ARNI also. These are the drugs for uh, diabetic patients without compelling indication for beta blockers because they don't interfere with diabetes metabolism. If anything, these drugs actually, AC inhibitors, ARBs, protect their kidneys in the long run. With beta blockers, that kind of evidence is not there. So if there's no compelling indication, don't bother to use beta blockers because yeah. beta blockers, by their very nature, they tend to interfere with the manifestations of hypoglycemia. If hypoglycemia occurs, you have a problem there. The patient may not get all the classical symptoms of hypoglycemia, particularly increase in the heart rate. And the doctor to whom he goes with hypoglycemia may not find any patient may not complain. This is very common in my patients because I we go uh, out of our way and check their A1C and blood sugars every time he walks into the clinic. And I find not an often, patient says, I have no hypoglycemic symptoms at all. But his sugars are very, very low. And his A1C is very low. Sometimes it comes to as low as uh, between 5.5 to 5.0. So these are patients who are having silent hypoglycemia. So you should be concerned about it. So beta blockers use them in diabetics only if there is a compelling indication. 
Correct. No, unless we, he has got vasospastic angina or any uh, cardiac problem, we okay. don't use beta blocker in diabetes. Uh, for the sake of, you know, hypoglycemic awareness may not be there and people will land yeah. in problem. So then uh, advising again, how to manage a case of young hypertensive who has associated problem of bronchial asthma as well? Well, that's a very good question. If there is bronchial asthma also, I would say you, uh, if you have to use a beta blocker, you use an abivolol. If you don't have to use a beta blocker, you don't have evidence of uh, a sympathetic overdrive. In those patients, you can use uh, you know, calcium channel blockers, you can use ARBs, any of those drugs which right. do not have much effect on uh, uh, bronchial asthma. Uh, sorry. The uh, I mean, but like questions. Okay, can you, uh, Sarat, can you send us questions? I think uh, suddenly your questions are okay. Um, Vishnu Prasad Deka, can we switch to new beta blocker from existing beta blockers? Yeah, you can switch if, uh, uh, um, you know, there is an indication. Um, I, I really do not see very great indications for such situations. I, as a cardiologist, go all out to produce a heart rate around 60 at rest. And if that is the aim, and you have given the patient, today, you know, etinolol we don't use for a lot of data is there. That one article that came in JAMA, uh, I'm sure Dr. Murugnathan has given many talks on this, that has put etinolol out of the market for practical purposes. Now our darlings have become metoprolol, succinate, and uh, you know, bisoprolol, of course, and many other drugs in India, particularly metoprolol is very popularly used. So if you are using these drugs and your aim of giving beta blocker therapy uh, to reduce the heart rate, you, you know, if giving beta blocker is not just for the sake of it. You need to, if you really want to achieve beta blockade, the clinical sign of beta blockade is a reduction in the uh, resting heart rate. And you want the rate to be as low as 60. If in my clinic I find a rate of 57, 60, I'm very happy with that even dose of beta blocker. Why should I change from one beta blocker to another beta blocker? If there is worsening of bronchospasm, patient never patient is a chronic smoker, he did not complain of COAD-like symptoms, but after you started a beta blocker, his condition worsens, then probably that is a case for shifting to nebivolol. Otherwise, in most of the situations, you don't change the beta blockers. If the patient develops heart failure, you should use one of these three beta blockers, isoprolol, metoprolol, succinate, or carvedilol. So some of these uh, areas, probably if the patient has migraine-like thing, as Dr. Purugnathan mentioned earlier, propanolol can be considered. Otherwise, normally, whatever beta blocker you are using, you should be satisfied with it. Step up its dose to the best possible dose to bring down the rate. Sometimes, despite using what is recommended heart rate, what is recommended dose, highest dose, you still don't achieve a, a bradycardia. In that case, sometimes ibabradin may be added to his uh, symptoms. Or if sometimes at the highest dose of beta blocker, a given beta blocker, patient is not able to tolerate, then you may have to step down on that dose and add ibabradin once again. Yeah, I see. Uh, the situation comes sometimes, people are uh, on atinolol for a long time, you know, like, you know, my mother Correct. was having atinolol for so long. Then we came to know atinolol is not that good drug. Then we have to shift atinolol to metoprolol. Now we use atinolol only in two conditions. One, if there is a liver failure, because atinolol is supposed to be good for liver. And also in HIV, the inter, inter uh, drugs acting is less with atinolol. So these two conditions only we use atinolol. Otherwise, we don't use atinolol. And if somebody has got atinolol for a long time, when they come to us, come to you or come to me, we say there is better deck than until all and we change. That's the occasion we sometimes change because this is a common practice for us. That's why we do that. Okay, Abhay Singh Diora again. Yeah, Sir, please. I just want to make two points at this point of uh, they are good points which you raised. Uh, Etin and all, actually, I'm sure you agree with me. It's a very effective beta blocker. Unfortunate that particular data has come uh, uh, that uh, it shows that it doesn't uh, really cross the blood brain barrier and uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the patient's reduction of sudden cardiac death evidence may not be there and so on and so forth. Otherwise, the etinolol is a very effective beta blocker. This is particularly true for me in patients who have, uh, uh, you know, um, rheumatic heart disease, mitral valve disease and fast heart rate. 
all other beta blockers, they reduce the rate to a certain extent, but nothing like adenolol. For me, a rheumatic heart disease patient with mitral valve disease, um, a commonly seen patient is a young lady who has mitral stenosis in either with or without MR. These are patients for whom your idea is to bring down the heart rate, particularly if there is patient has got atrial fibrillation. The best drug is adenolol. When I mentioned this in one of the European Society of Cardiology meetings, the uh, European cardiologists were all very depressed. They said, no, no, you know, etinolol is outdated. We should use metoprolol. But the fact is, uh, nothing controls the heart rate in a rheumatic heart disease patient as good as well as etinolol. Yeah, may, I, think, uh, I think still we people use it. And I think we'll have the last question now. Uh, um, I will see the questionnaire, Mayank Prave. Uh, between the thing equal dose of beta blocker, yes, we already answered. Uh, what is the usual suitable dose of uh, bisoprolol and what is the maximum dose you can use? Well, normal doses of uh, um, uh, you know, bisoprolol we use are usually five milligrams to start with. If your target heart rate has not been achieved, you go to 10. Beyond 10, if you go, people have gone up to 20 also in some of the reports. The specificity of beta-1 selective blockade goes off. So usual working dose is 5 to 10 milligrams. OK, uh, fine. And uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. OK, now the what are the main side effects of bisoprolol if you use continuously? Well, you know, being a cardioselective beta blocker, usually these patients do very well with this. I have so many patients in whom uh, we regularly use uh, bisoprolol. Uh, nobody came and said any of these things. But the side effects are like, you know, uh, any of the beta blockers, like an occasional patient who has worsening of uh, his lung condition, which is a smoker, history of bronchial asthma, COPD, etc. That, that is one occasional patient. Particularly, this is true if you use in very high doses. Uh, in patients like that, we tend to avoid very high doses, but that is one area. Erectile dysfunction, I have not seen any patient who came to me and said that he's having erectile dysfunction because of bisoprolol. So, you know, usual mention is like this, uh, usual side effects like any other beta blocker. There's no specific beta blocker in specific side effect in relation to uh, bisoprolol. The other side effects that are mentioned are, you know, uh, masking of hypoglycemia, excessive fatigue, weakness, and uh, so on and so forth. Of course, like, you know, uh, vivid dreams and uh, lack of sleep, usual side effects of uh, beta blockers. They, to my knowledge, there's nothing very specific about uh, long-term use of uh, uh, bisoprolol. Yeah, it, it's sometimes individual variation. When you use uh, drugs like antidepressants or nitrates or the beclofen or uh, tamazolozine, or levodopa and rifampicin, sometimes bisoprolol acts uh, differently. So uh, not everyone, but you must be uh, 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 careful when you use this drug, and particularly an individual where there is problem, then you'll have to think about interchanging of drugs. Otherwise, bisoprolol is a very good drug, safe drug, no side effects. Compared to other drugs, it has the same beta blocker side effects, not much. Even, uh, even in uh, renal insufficiency patients, uh, unless the renal insufficiency is severe, like uh, EGF are less than 40, uh, bisoprolol can be used very uh, happily. And similarly, unless it is severe liver failure, bisoprolol can be uh, used without any uh, impunity. Uh, it is excreted both by the kidneys and the liver. And therefore, uh, unless the patient has got uh, liver and renal failure both, in majority of the cases, uh, there is unless the uh, insufficiency of the liver or kidney is severe, bisoprolol can be used without any hesitation. Yeah, actually, bisoprolol uh, starts acting in two to three hours, but the full effect of the bisoprolol may sometimes take to two to six weeks also. So sometimes you'll have to wait. Suppose you give the drug and you say there is no effect. You have to wait at least two weeks before uh, you yes. uh, do that. So I think uh, uh, there are no more questions now. We will have to conclude. I think final message, uh, Sarachandra, for the audience, some drive home message, not only for beta blockers, generally about hypertension your final message to the audience. Okay, you know, um, once Dr. Muruganathan asked me to give a talk on uh, 
hypertension in children in the pediatric age group at that point as i was going through uh, the different uh, publications i find childhood hypertension has become a big big thing in india all over the world probably because there is an increase in childhood obesity in the united states also but in india this is a very big problem uh, when i used to go to drop my uh, daughter in the jubilee hills public school i used to find whole lot of uh, young kids with obesity so uh, they they were all less than class 10 so important thing is start checking their blood pressure and blood sugar right from the school age that's a very important thing uh, regular checking of blood pressure as the person grows older is very important and it is very well exemplified by the patient who about whom i mentioned he never underwent blood pressure checking today it is impossible to believe that such patients exist but they do exist so preventive checkups are the key to prevention of long term cardiovascular events or for that matter any any adverse effects of hypertension so frequent checking of uh, blood pressure starting from a very young age this can never be over emphasized the world hypertension day um, one of the messages is start checking your blood pressure treat it effectively and live longer probably that applies very well to hypertension what is your uh, I take on this i mean you are you are yeah, you've seen yeah, hypertension day in and out yeah, yeah. you know so much actually, about it yeah in actually in hypertension day we must create awareness first you know many people they don't check the blood pressure that is why i said opportunity screening even if they come for a, 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 a headache or some accident some little finger pain we have to check the blood pressure i go one step further i check the blood pressure for the attendants also so that this opportunity screening gives you an idea who are the hypertensive because in india the awareness is less and the control rate is less than 12% so how do we uh, control only by awareness and then uh, start treating the patient and one thing which i in my experience of found out is promoting home blood pressure monitoring because now people uh, now learned to use uh, home blood pressure monitoring that gives the empowerment for that patient to know that he is hypertensive whether drug is acting or not acting so promote home blood pressure monitoring and my passion is you should have hypertension specialist who focus on hypertension hypertension is much more prevalent mortality morbidity is more than three times more than diabetes but no can corner we get diabetologists but we don't have hypertension or this or hypertension specialist so we want the speaker I and mean, the, the learned uh, delegates to focus on hypertension maintain a hypertension registry promote home blood pressure monitoring and uh, advise them as early as possible aggressively treat them uh, don't have clinician inertia and then uh, lack of adherence is another reason why the control is not there now the drugs are very cheap and uh, lifelong you have to give the drug so uh, counsel them the day one and tell them to adapt, i mean uh, observe lifestyle modification simple style what sarchandra said dash diet less salt less fats and all these things will go in a long way more than that you are lifestyle modification like you must be calm and not under tension check the pressure periodically and um, go to the doctor uh, regularly adjust the dose and then have a long life live longer accurate measurement and live longer control the blood pressure this is the message of the world hypertension this is this is applicable for all the days not only world hypertension day uh every time you know you love to uh, do this so i thank uh, sarachandra for the excellent uh, discussion and an excellent uh, uh, exposition of the topic and uh, beta blockers are the good drugs in hypertension uh, especially in indian setup we have to use of course european guidelines says one of the drugs is uh, beta blocker but there is american guidelines in the first four line drugs beta blocker is not there but there is indian hypertension guidelines we also say beta blocker because as sarachandra said we are indians are more sympathetic over drive and so we love to use beta blocker so thank you very much uh, uh, grace and uh, ali smoothy for uh, you know making us thank you sir important subject and i thank sarachandra for the excellent uh, talk i i think you should uh, keep this in the website so that people who missed it can listen to sarachandra leshali and yes. uh, earn lot of new points yeah over to you for right. conclusion yeah thank you sir uh, in fact sir taking cue from uh, what you just said 
the recording of uh, this webinar will be available on the microlabs website so it will be archived there so doctors who have missed it can always go and see sir and it's also on youtube so they can also go there and see so uh, sir from uh, microlabs uh, i uh, i thank uh, both the doctors for an excellent i mean this webinar has gone on for more than one hour sir uh, to be precise it has been an excellent lucid presentation by dr sharad chandra thank you very much sir and dr muruganathan thank you so much for moderating it so well in fact a lot of points have come up and a lot of questions were answered uh, in detail so i'm sure there had been a lot of take home points for the audience as well and i thank all the doctors who had uh, participated and uh, would like to tell them that uh, this beating heart webinar series will happen every month and we will come back to you with a new topic next month so on behalf so of what michael you have to, I, Ari, Ari, what yes, you sir. have to do if you are yes. doing a series of meeting you should uh, announce what are the titles you are going to discuss so that will be like a master class what sarachandra and myself are doing we had 31 webinars and 31 days that we have given the topics and okay. uh, sarachandra discussed about hypertension in children so like that you know at next time hypertension in elderly sure. person like sure. that if you have the series of talk people okay. will uh, be happy to join and then uh, uh, you know learn Dr. absolutely Murugan's, uh, you know website the whole academy so much of uh, you know academic discussions take place it's really mind boggling to listen to him and his colleagues uh, one of them of course is dr rajshekar from uh, kumbakonam and uh, another doctor is palani abban from uh, uh, virzi from sir uh, i think trichy uh, yeah he's uh, chennai pan chennai pan Chenia Pan. Chenia Pan. No, Chenia Pan. Yes, correct. Dr. Chenia and and yes. they're, they're out, outstanding speakers, outstanding speakers. And sir's presence there, I would tell all these young fellows who are listening to uh, this uh, particular discussion today, they should just go to Hold Medical Academy. And in fact, I registered more than one fellow for that, so that you know mm -hmm. they can also not only read about what is written there, also listen to many of these uh, webinars that go on. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, chairing this session. And yeah. my sincere thanks to Murthy and all other colleagues from Microlabs at Hyderabad and your, at your headquarters. Thank you so yeah, much. In fact, sir. In fact, in fact, thank you. Thank because you. Because of you, I agree yes. to be a moderator because tomorrow I'm going out of country. So I have to uh, oh, you know, do a lot of uh, okay. uh, you know, arrangements. But because Sarachandra is uh, giving, it's my pleasure to be with him. And uh, we always together you know, do a lot of good things. And he's a great academician. Hats off to him. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Continue your good work. Next time you can Thank add you, Kahoot, Kahoot also. There's a, a multiple choice questions yes. which you can add also in Kahoot. Whenever oh. we do, we include a Kahoot also. It's a multiple choice question. I will show you next time. Uh, we can right, get sir. the questions from the speaker and can put 10 questions. We make the audience also participate. So that will be interesting yeah. for them also to involve them. It's called Kahoot. Sure, sir. Okay. Kahoot. Yes, Fine. yes. Thank you. We Thank will you. do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank sir. you all doctors. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste.